Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in this learning outcome we're going to be looking at the material selection processes used in engineering. Now the first type of material selection processes we're going to look at involve analysing the properties of given materials and then selecting materials based on the desired properties. So we're going to begin this topic with an example and we're going to begin with the example of an electrical cable. Now there's two materials to consider in this instance. First of all we have the material at the core of the cable. And the core of the cable is going to require high electrical conductivity. The reason being is the electricity needs to pass through the core of the cable. If we compare that in contrast with the sheath or the shroud around the cable, we don't want the electricity to pass through this shroud, so this is going to need low electrical conductivity. Or said a different way, it's going to need high electrical resistivity. Recall that electrical conductivity and electrical resistivity are the inverses of each other. So I guess we could also say the core of the cable needs low electrical resistivity. We don't want it to resist the flow of electricity. Now if we consider some additional properties, the core of our cable needs to be ductile. The reason being is we need to be able to take that material and draw it into a wire. And when we looked at the property of ductility, we mentioned that a ductile material can easily be drawn into wires. And when we come on to look at ductility, we're going to consider something called elongation. And elongation will be expressed as a percentage. Now in terms of adding the shroud to the cable, a process known as extrusion is used. So we need a material that can be easily moulded. And we'll look at the process of extrusion in a little more depth in a later tutorial. So let's begin by looking at the electrical conductivity and the electrical resistivity of different materials. So on the screen here we have a chart of resistivity versus cost and before we analyse this chart I just want to credit this resource to the website where I found it and I actually found this resource on a website materials.eng.cam.ac.uk and you can see the web address in the top left hand corner. Now on the study platform I've provided some images of these charts but the advantage of visiting the website is that these charts are actually interactive. So on the study platform, I'm going to provide a link to all of these interactive charts that we're using throughout this tutorial. Now what I mean by these charts being interactive is as follows. As we look at this chart, we can see that we have resistivity on the y-axis and we have cost on the x-axis. And we're going to analyse those in a bit more detail. But what we can see immediately is the group that has the lowest resistivity and hence the best conductivity is our metals and alloys group. So what we can actually do is click on the metals and alloys group and it will highlight some different materials within that group. So we're going to make some annotations to this graph and a couple of things to draw your attention to first of all is that the scales on the x and y axis are not linear scales, they're actually logarithmic scales. So if for example we take this 10 to the minus 3 on our y axis well, 10 to the minus 3 is the same as 1 times 10 to the minus 3, which is actually 0 0.001. In effect, our decimal place has gone back 3 points, like so. If we look at our next increment, we have 10 to the 3. Well, 10 to the 3, or 1 times 10 to the 3, is 1,000. And if we go from 10 to the 3 to our next increment, here we have 10 to the 9, which is actually a billion. That's one with nine zeros on the end. So we have a logarithmic scale, not a linear scale. And we see the same on our x-axis. So what that means, if we focus on our y-axis, is that the metals have low resistivity and high conductivity, but their conductivity is vastly different from the next group, which would probably be the ceramics. Here we see the metals with resistivity values below 10 to the minus 3, and we see ceramics with values above 10 to the minus 3, but small differences in that scale will lead to a huge difference in terms of the resistivity. So now let's focus in a little bit further. For the core of our cable, we're looking for a material with high electrical conductivity or low resistivity. 
And if we focus on the very bottom of the highlighted group, those are our materials with the highest conductivity and lowest resistivity. So there's two that stand out there. We have aluminium, represented by this band here, and we have copper, represented by this small circle here. So what we can actually do based on our first property is shortlist aluminium and copper. For the time being, we're going to disregard cost. We're basically looking for the best conductor rather than the best conductor per unit cost. Now, whilst we have this chart available, we might as well look at the resistivity for the shroud of our cable. Recall that we need that to be highly resistant to the flow of electricity. So this time, rather than focusing on our metals and alloys group, we're actually going to focus on our polymers group. And you can see here that polymers clearly represent the most resistant materials. So let's highlight some polymers that we've seen before. We've seen polystyrene, we've seen polyethylene, and we've seen polypropylene. We've also seen PVC. So in that top left hand corner, where the cost is relatively low and the resistivity is very high, we have four potential materials, polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene, and PVC. And there's very little difference in the resistivity and cost of each of those. Okay, so let's return to our diagram. And for the core of our cable, we've now been able to shortlist copper, and we've been able to shortlist aluminium. And for our shroud, we're looking at materials such as PVC, polyvinyl chloride, polyethylene, polypropylene. So let's consider our next property. For the core, let's look at the ductility of both copper and aluminium. So here we have another chart from materials.eng.cam.ac.uk. And this time we have elongation versus strength. So on the y-axis we have strength, we're less interested in that property for the time being, and on the x-axis we have elongation. Recall that we're looking at two different materials, they're both metals, aluminium and copper, so I'm going to highlight the metals and alloys group. Now what you'll probably notice is that aluminium and copper aren't included on this diagram, but I found some information from another resource for both the strength and the elongation of these two materials, and I'm going to add them to our chart. So for copper, we have a strength of 330 megapascals and an elongation of 17%. 17% is the same as 0.17. So first of all, let's locate our point on the y-axis for strength. Recall that this is a logarithmic scale, so we have 100, 200, 300, so we're somewhere above that third index mark. And we'll add a line. So we're somewhere around here. Now aluminium has a strength of 90 megapascals and a percentage elongation of 12%. So let's add for 90, just below the 100 here. Now we come on to percentage elongation for these two materials, and as mentioned, Copper has a percentage elongation of 0.17, or 17%. So we have 0.1, again it's a log scale, so this will be 0.2. Therefore, our mark is going to be just below the 0.2. So somewhere around there. Aluminium, by contrast, has a percentage elongation of 12%, so we're going to be somewhere around here. So here we have two points of interest. This one here is copper, Cu, and this one here is aluminium, Al. Now what we can see from this diagram is that copper has a higher percentage elongation. Now from the chart, it only looks like a small difference, but the difference between 12% and 17% is quite considerable. Recall that these are logarithmic scales, which is why these two points appear to be close together. Now for this example, we're only interested in how ductile the material is. If we were interested in how much force was required to stretch the material, or how much energy we were going to use, then we may reconsider aluminium. But based purely on ductility or percentage elongation, we can see that copper is the preferred material. Now let's look at the final property for the shroud, 
and the property that we're interested in is thermal conductivity or thermal resistance. Now the chart that we're going to look at this time was created using CES EduPack 2018, which is a product of Granta Design Limited. Now Granta Design Limited have developed software for material selection and for producing these charts, and it's very powerful software for advanced material selection. They do also provide various different charts for education purposes, and we're going to be looking at one of these charts now. So on this chart, we see two different properties. On the y-axis, we have thermal expansion, and on the x-axis, we have thermal conductivity. And it's thermal conductivity that we're interested in. And in particular, we're interested in the thermal conductivity of polyethylene, polypropylene, and PVC. Of those materials listed there, we can see polyethylene with a thermal conductivity of around 0.14. Now, in addition to polyethylene, PVC or polyvinyl chloride has a thermal conductivity of around 0.19. So it's actually more thermally conductive than polyethylene. And although it's not listed on the chart here, it would sit somewhere around here in the group so higher in thermal conductivity. As thermal resistivity is the inverse of thermal conductivity, what we want is materials closer to the left on that scale. So based on that information, the material that we're going to choose for the shroud is polyethylene. Okay, so let's review. For the core of our electrical cable, based on the electrical conductivity, we shortlisted copper and aluminium. We then went on to look at the ductility or percentage elongation of those two materials and what we found was that copper was the more ductile material. Therefore, based on those grounds, we selected copper for the core of our cable. For the shroud or the sheath around the cable, we considered the electrical resistivity and we shortlisted a number of different polymers, PVC, polyethylene and polypropylene. But because each of those were very closely matched, we decided to consider an additional property, the thermal conductivity. And what we know is that ideally we want that shroud to have high thermal resistivity. Now recall that thermal resistivity is the inverse of conductivity. So we looked at the property of thermal conductivity and we selected the material with the lowest thermal conductivity. And the material that we chose in that instance was polyethylene. So copper has the best electrical conductivity and ductility. And polyethylene has the best electrical resistivity and thermal resistivity.